Okay, folks, we should be live in a few seconds, okay? I'll see when. Francis, oh. you're muted. Ha ha! This is a, I apologize. This is a gremlin that attacked me at the last conference I was in. Do apologize. So let me say that again. Welcome and good afternoon to everyone um, to the Academy of Arts, Letters, Culture, and Public Affairs webinar from Soka to Soka The Evolution of a Musical Genre. This is the first in a series of conversations presented on re ongoing research, delving into the evolution, the growth, the formulation of our local products, cultural products, Calypso, Soka, and so on. This evening, we are joined with, by um, Professor Hollis Urban Lester Liverpool, who is a veteran educator and Calypsonian with more decades in the business than we might want to count. Um, nine time Calypso monarch, currently the head of the Academy of Arts, Letters, Culture and Public Affairs and the father of the Masters of Arts and Carnival Studies program. He will be joined and followed immediately by Tamiko Spicy Moore who has been writing and singing Calypso since primary school. She is a reigning Bush monarch She's a graduate of the Masters of Arts and Carnival Studies program, a dedicated educator, and a shadow scholar. She will be followed by Mr. Lutalo Masimbo, better known as Brother Resistance, who is the president of Trinidad Trinbago, Trinbago Unified Calypsonian Organization, a pioneer of the Rapso art form, champion of Calypso music um, and all its iterations, and a 2012 graduate of the MAX program. He will be followed by Martin Mice Raymond, who is a musician, producer, sound engineer with over three decades of experience at home and abroad. He is an assistant professor in the Academy of Performing Arts and also a graduate of the MAX program. And he will be joined by Robin Imancha, and this is gonna sound very similar, who has, has been involved in the creation of music as a producer, engineer, and musician for over 30 years. He's a senior instructor at the APA and also a graduate of the MAX program. We will also be joined by two of our more recent graduates, Jeffrey Anderson Bolden and Bryce Boyce. Um, both are forging ahead in the promotion of carnival and Caribbean culture. And our discussion today is the evolution of that, what um, Joycelyn Jibo says, most people take just as party music, but music that does a lot of cultural work in society. Soka to Soka. Welcome everybody. Welcome um, all the audience. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Liverpool to get us rolling. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Francis. 
Chairman and Hostess, Dr. Francis, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the, Uni of the University of Trinidad Tobago, who I'm really listening, Professor Imbe, Board of Governors, professors, lecturers, carnivalists, Calypsonians, ladies and gentlemen, and students. It's a pleasure to be here. And my, my short talk this, this, this afternoon is to talk about the origin of the soca. But let me warn you before that I am talking about the origin of the soca based upon my experiences in the, in the 70s. And my first experience with the soca, let me say on the onset, is with Ra Shorty, who at that time was known as Lord Shorty, who came into Port of Spain in 1965 to sing at OIB, original OIB Young Brigade, fresh from his victory in Calypso over composer, deceased composer, deceased Duke, and Black Stalin. He won the competition in the South and he came into Port of Spain. And that's where I first met him. And I have always associated the soca rhythm with Ra Shorty I because that is my experience. At the time, as I said, he was known as Lord Shorty. And when he came down to, to Trinidad singing at the, at the OIB, I actually first met him to talk to and, and discuss with him this soca rhythm in 1968. He was singing there for three years, but I met him actually in 68 to discuss with him to talk, 68. And he was part of the Calypso King Finals in 1968. And the secretary of the NCC, not, no NCC, or at that time was the CDC, picked both of us up and took us to the Savannah to discuss the Calypso King finals. And there I had a lovely chat with Rash Oti, and I was asking him at the time what he was singing, etc. And he was singing two calypsos called, one was called Budget, composed, would you believe it, composed by the mighty Duke. And he was singing a calypso called Country Girl. And he was telling me about this, his idea about Calypso and Soka, and we had a lovely chat. And then we met again for many years in, this, in the Virgin Islands in 1968 onwards, 1970s. We had a common friend in St. Vincent, we met in St. Vincent, a guy called Chester Rogers. And we were always talking about this music because Shorty was always talking about his music, etc. And I was a very, I was a keen listener. I should tell you that in Shorty's youth, he was fascinated by the mouth organ he was fascinated by the tassel drums and he was fascinated by the guitar. He was a wonderful guitarist. A lot of people don't know that because I used to sit down in St. Thomas and listen to Shorty playing that guitar. And I would ask him about what he used to call his lick, L-I-C-K, how he strummed the guitar. So, he, by, and by 1968, he mastered the guitar and he loved to play the guitar. And you'll tell me that he first started on the mouth organ, you know, I suppose, his parents would have played the mouth organ for him, or give him a mouth organ. And he played all these things. He grew up in Lengua in South Trinidad at the time, which was predominantly Indian. So that many Indian traits he learned and many Indian traits impacted on his music. And besides, besides music, he, he, he loved sports. I just, we don't have time to go into that. But he was fascinated by good lyrics, the good lyrics of Sparrow and Kitsch and would you believe us? His admirer was Blakey, Lord Blakey. So those are the three Calypsonians who, who impacted on him. And I should say a fourth Calypsonian impacted on him, Indian weddings. He used, he used to go to Indian weddings and listen to the music of the Tassa and et cetera. Hence, when, he come, when we come on to see Om Shanti, you will see all those religious and those Indian chants in his music. Well, by 1973 uh, he's, and 74, he started this idea of this, this, soca, this soca rhythm. It's the first time I heard it. He first used it, he first used it in 1974, I should say, when he composed this calypso and he sang and recorded this calypso called Soul Calypso Music. That was 1974, I remember it well. And he, he spelled it S-O-K-A-H. And it meant, he tried to put some soul into the calypso. And I asked him what he meant. And he was saying that, he told me, that he put some soul into the calypso that I played just now. But between 1974 and 1977, many Calypsoians embraced the soca, the soca rhythm. And I had the pleasure of chatting with Shorty on a special talk show at TTT in 1978. This special talk show, 
put on by a guy called a fat Indian, a fat Chinese guy called Wellington Chong. And he called me, don't know why, but he called me and he called uh, Rashorty. And those days he was just Shorty. And he called Mighty Composer. And we three met at TTT to discuss this soca rhythm. And there we asked Shorty a lot of questions. And Wellington Chong asked him a lot of questions. And Shorty explained on the show that he got this rhythm and he's got this idea from Ed Watson. Ed Watson, for those of you who don't know, was the band leader at OIB. And Ed Watson, the year before, had gone to Nigeria. And Ed Watson had brought back this rhythm. Of course, all the African rhythms that is, have, have some common licks in it. And, and Ed Watson had told him about this music. And Ed Watson had told him that the Calypso was drab. And the Calypso needed some changing. And Shorty himself discussed, and Ed Watson said, that this Calypso needs some changing because it's so drab. I'll tell you why. Ed had heard this African this music, all of, all of them the same, and Ed found that the Calypso music resembled the music of Nigeria. So Ed brought back these rhythms and asked Shorty to compose something on this new African beat, he being the band leader. Now, so therefore, he blended, Shorty would tell me, that he blended the tassa drum as the bass and the guitar with a different lick. And I always ask him, what you meant by lick? And you'll say the different strum, you know, different strum. And you use that, that's an important word, L-I-C-K, a different lick. And he tried to produce, use that to produce what he called the soca rhythm. And he called the soca rhythm S-O-K-A-H. And Edwardson, this is the same rhythm that Edwardson later gave to Kitchener when Kitchener sang the, the Calypso, Sugar Boom Boom. So the soul music at the time came, he said, from trying to put some soul into the calypso. At that time, one hears the music of, or the rhythms of Otis Redding and Wilson Pickett and Nina Simone, and, actu and Nina Simone actually came to Trinidad. I, I met her at, at Lord Williams' house. Nina Simone and Marvin Gaye and Diana Ross, and they were all singing the soul. And Shorty was telling me that he was trying to put some soul into the Calypso. That's a little confusion because what Shorty was saying is that I am not trying to put American soul into the Calypso. I'm trying to put some feeling into the Calypso because he found the drug. So that he had other reasons. One of the other reasons he had is that the, the, he found that the, the reggae was leaving the Calypso. The reggae with, 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 with Bob Marley at the helm was leaving the Calypso. And then you had in the 70s, Teddy Pendergrass and the Jackson Five and the Jackson singing all this soul music. And Shorty was flabbergasted and he's saying, what happened to the Calypso? And then when Ed Watson come and, comes up and tell him that your music is drab, he decided to change it. But he tried to change it for a, a, another reason. One of the reasons that have probably have not been written is that Shorty was trying to sell some records and he was trying to bring the Indians into the audience, many Indians who didn't come to, into the audience at the time. So he felt that if I bring in the Indian music and the tabla, and if I bring in the African drums, etc., I'll sell some more records, especially to the Indian people. So he combined what we call the African, the Africa from, from Edwardson, and the Indian, and don't forget the Trinidadian, of course, the can't leave the Trinidadian. Many persons say African and Indian, and they forget the, they forget the, 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 the Trinidadian. But he put all them together. And he's, he was saying that when I put all these things together, I'll get some soul into the Calypso. And I was there, thank God. I was, thank God I was there at TGT. And Shorty was saying, I am trying to put some soul into the Calypso. And therefore, my music is called Soul Calypso. And that Soul Calypso, would you believe that, that from 1974? I remember that him that even in 1977, when, he's, when he, his recording in 77 was called Soka, the soul of Calypso, 1977. And he spelled Soka, S-O-K-A-H. And the, the Ka being the first alphabet in the, Indian, in, 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 the, in the first letter in the Indian alphabet. So the recording was called in 1977, Soka, the soul of Calypso. When he sang in 1974, 
soul calypso music. He called it soul calypso music. And he called it, and the recording itself was called Soka, S-O-K-A-H, 1974. So that, this, this is how Shorty explained to Wellington Chung, myself, and composer, what he meant by putting some soul into the music. Uh, I want to say that when he, when, when, he, when he did that, a lot of people, a lot of Calypsonians objected. A lot of Calypsonians saw it as a challenge. And lots of Calypsonians said they're not taking part in Shorty's soul. In fact, Art Nikoto, who was our band leader in our tent at the time, he said that he is not playing soul music. I remember him talking to Funny, and he was telling Lord Funny, he said, that music you're playing, I ain't playing it, you know. I ain't arranging that at all, you know. So, so Art Nikoto refused at the time in the 70s to play soul music. And I remember composer saying, and these were ex his exact words, he says, I am not a Sokinian. I am not a Sokinian and I'm not playing music. So for shorty, the soul is, is the S-O of soul and the car K -A -H was the first alphabet, first letter in the alphabet of the Indian, of the Indian people thing. That's why he sang, I can't, I remember he singing in those words, I can't read, I can't write music, but every day I compose it, etc. And he says, my system is rhythm. So Shorty was, was based upon rhythm. What I remember, however, also on those days, is that we were, we as young Calypsonians, or early Calypsonians, we were flabbergasted by Shorty's melodies, Om Shanti, Whom God Bless, Soka Fever, Endless vibration, and and that music really impacted on us with, with, with that kind of that that kind of rhythm, and he called it in, in 1978. His record was called Soka Explosion, but in 1978 he spelt it S O C A. And that caused a little confusion, whereas before he called it S O K A H, he called it S O C A. And I happened to ask him what you meant by S O C A. And again, you tell me that Om Shanti, whom God bless, Soka fever, he says, is the soul of Calypso. I'm putting some soul into the Calypso. Another reason why we had liked Shorty and, 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 and find him outstanding is that he was singing a lot of songs about Indian women. And uh, you, you had to be very strong in those days to sing, a, sing about making love to Indian women. And therefore, he was singing Om Shanti and Indrani and all these, these kind of songs. And, we were, we, we, were, we, were, we were flabbergasted with his chord system. For those of you who don't know, Shorty was a, prom, a prolific gu guitarist. I used to listen to his minor major chords. So many people don't play those minor major chords again. Terra is one of those guys who used to play minor major chords. And when I went to St. Thomas, I would see Shorty playing all these minor major chords. But his rhyming schemes, his minor major chords, and all that, that and his guitar lick mesmerizes. And one can't one cannot talk about 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 soca without talking about the memories of the great musicians who caused it who caused it to, who exploded in that soca music and and spread the music like dispersal of seeds like Roderick Bord the saxophone like Cyril Diaz like Frankie Francis like Bert Innes like Ed Watson the band leader like Henry and Buko from from Saint, from 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 Saint Anne's. On, on, on the saxophone and Vasily de Freitas playing and Joey Lewis on the guitar and Errol Lenz on his trumpet and Frankie McIntosh. Those are the guys who spread that music. Ad, not Adiko to Adiko to playing that. And when you come to, in, by 1979, you have Kitchener having his record and here is Kitchener singing on his record and Kitchener's calling his record Soka Millicent. Soka Millicent, M I L L I C E N T, and but Soka S O C. So the word spread, and even Kitchener, who at the beginning did not take it up right away, started with Soka Boom Boom. But nearly all the Calypsonians in, and all the musicians, including including um, Ronnie McIntosh's father, Adi Koto, they took up the music and started spreading. So my experience was shorty. What I want to show you now, Christian, if you could help me quickly. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but Kitchen, if you could help me put up, up that piece of music there. Um, I want to show you the, the difference in, in what, what we sang before. And when, and after shortly, people began to write music on the bass. 
when I began to sing Calypso in the, 60, in the 60s, we never write any music. We wrote no music at all for the bass. But after Shorty came, we began to write music for the bass because Shorty impacted on us. If you look at that first piece there for me, that first, first line, those four, first four, four chords, that's how we sang Calypso before Shorty. That was our bass line. We never had, we never played our bass line in, in Calypso. We never played any bass line in the Calypso team. The bass man used to play the music of the guitarist. Again, the bass man used to play the music of the guitarist. After shortly, we wrote music for the bass. And if, look at that first line there. I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but if, 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 if Christian could help me, you see, boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, then we repeat. Boom, 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 boom. I think that's slow, so you'll get it. That was the, the style of the bass guitarist. You might also get the second one. Look at the second one. Second one, we have this, those six notes there. Is boom, boom. See, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Boom 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 See, and that's how we played. That's how we played the bass in those days. Let me go again. Boom 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 That was the bass, and that 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 was great. And especially when Arthur get on those tall bass. On those those bass that, that they played, it was just those tall, what do they call them, those tall bass, et cetera. And that was how we played the Calypso. That was the original Calypso bass line. Look at the last one for timing. If you go down to the last one for me, see the soca bass there? We have two, we have two beats, quiet, and then two beats. Rest, 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 dum, dum, rest, dum, boom, rest, rest, dum, dum, rest, rest. Dum, dum, rest, rest. Dum dum rest, dum dum rest, dum dum rest, dum dum rest, rest, dum dum. Let me go again for those of who don't know again. Go again. First two notes are we rest, dum dum rest, 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 dum dum rest, rest, dum dum rest, rest, dum dum rest, rest, dum dum. That was the original soca bass. Later on, the fellas being all kind of thing, but do drum, but do boom, and all. They being all kind of thing, tum, bo, drum, boom, tum, bo, drum, boom. <coughs> but Shorty changed that. That was the soca bass. So Shorty made a, a distinct change in that the rhythm pattern of that bass line, and that's where that's in my experience that was the beginning of the soca music in Trinidad and Tobago, and it spread not only to the Trinidad and Tobago. But they spread throughout the Caribbean and throughout the Americas, London, etc. And that was my experience of the beginning of the soca beat. I hope I brought some enterprise to using my experiences. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liverpool, for that very insightful um, insight that, into the history and development of soca. Um, and Ra Shorty I's input, or Lord Shorty as he was then, his input in the creation of a new musical genre. Next, we have um, Tamiko Spicy Moore, and she, followed by um, Brother Resistance, will be talking about the musical input of Calypsonians, other than Lord Shorty, to the evolution of soca music. So take it away, spicy. A very blessed good afternoon to one and all. Thank you for having me here on this panel today. So we start with the, the discussion today is on the evolution of soca music. So from my part today, as we examine the soca music, the evolution as it is stated, my part in this discussion would be to highlight Shadow's contribution to what this local art form. Now, I have heard a lot of definitions for what is soca music, but one commonality 
that I would find that I found in those definitions was that, and I'm paraphrasing everybody here when I say this, it starts with Calypso. <clears throat> so from this point, I will start sharing my contribution toward the discussion. Now, a significant contributor, contributor to the development of Calypso music is Dr. Winston Bailey, The Shadow. And he believed that there was no separation in the music. I mean, the man come from the house of music. And he believed that there was no separation with Calypso and Soka. Right? It was all one music and Calypso music evolved. So proof of this theory is 2001 Soka Monarch with Stranger. That was a Calypso. Right? Also, in a time where soca music dominated the road march, he won with Calypso, with a Calypso, Stranger. So what he would have contributed toward the development of the Calypso, what he would have contributed toward the development would be toward the development of Calypso as the art form, right? Um, while everyone <clears throat> else was looking for ways to... Uh, to experiment and to fuse the music in that experimental period of the 70s, everyone was looking outward. We would have had fusions, fusions with disco and we would have had fusions with funk, etc. But what we show about Andy Proof is in the music with Shadow is that Shadow fused, fused with himself. He fused Calypso music with himself. So while everyone was looking outward, Shadow was searching deep within, right? To get into the, Af the West African rhythms that so deeply rooted in Tobago, yeah? Now, his contribution to the evolution of Calypso music was rooted in home. And if I may say that was the missing element in Calypso music that everybody would have been trying to fuse to form this new music. It, it, we didn't need to form a, mu a new music in my point of view. What we needed to do was develop what we have and we still find that we have that problem today. Now, a young shadow would have been preparing because as I said, He took a lot from the tambourine band with the rhythms that he has in his music. And he would have been preparing because as a little boy, Shadow used to break beach. And when he's supposed to be in school, he was on the tree, a big tree on top, like it hill, beating the bucket, practicing the rhythm to put in the music that is so influential in what we call the soca music today. Right? Um, We have, we're talking here now about one of Bailey's early contribution, which would have been the melodic bass lines in Calypso music, which are so predominant in the soca music of today. And while most believe that Shadow started using the melodic bass lines in 74, he started since 71 and are talking about with the threat steel pan men please listen to me pum 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 dig the beat of the melody pim pum 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 that was the melodic bass and i know in 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 calypso music and in our local art form shadow is known as the bass man he is known as the one who who influenced everybody else with the use of this melodic bass. Now, be careful because I'm not saying that he was the first. I am saying that he popularized the use of the melodic bass with bass man. But he did it before in 71 with the threat and other calypsos coming down, right? Um, Shadows influence of the west african rhythm from the tambourine band within the music that we could find in the soca music of today um we find that we have artists today who when they're going to make when they go into producers to to create the productions for the season or they're creating the soca songs and they would go to the producer and ask for a shadow beat 
right? Then we find that other than looking for the shadow beat, we see there is evidence that the shadow beat has been successful for many from the 70s to now. And if we're talking about now as what we say soca, if soca music is what it is, we say it is now, then plenty people doing because I don't say shadow doing soca. Shadow didn't say he was doing soca. Then I would say plenty people doing shadow music because shadow in my point of view is a, a, a genre on its own. And I ain't just talking about a genre with the music, I'm talking about a genre with the style, a, a genre with the dress, a genre with how he expressed the things that he expressed, right? Um, we find today that we see seeing that in plenty of the soca artists that we have out here today and that, that influence, that strong influence of Shadow's music is not limited is not limited to just the drum and bass. It's the drum, the bass, the rhythms, the style, the predominance of the of the, the synthesizing of the horns, right? And I'm talking about while we say while we say that soca music is not calypso music, and as I said before, Shadow prove it with stranger winning with a calypso shadows development with the genre calypso music being a inward his his contribution from an inward look for instance he would have developed on top of the calypso beat and swing to the right into the rapso art form when he did poverty as hell right so he fused that into calypso he didn't change and say it was something else it was calypso right um we find today that the successes of 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 many monarchs and who winning big titles would have all drawn from the energies of shadows music and shadows sound so that must say something when we talk about the development and the evolution of soca music that's my contribution for today thank you and thank you miss moore um and there's a lot to talk about when we talk about as you see a shadow sound melodic bass synthesized horns and so on and i just want to remind our audience please feel free to leave questions in the comments and we will address those questions after the panelists have presented. Thank you. So come up with your questions, put it there, and we will address as many questions as possible. So I wanna move on now to Brother Resistance, who will also be looking at the musical input of Calypsonians other than Shorty for the evolution of Soka. Yeah, greetings. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to be a part of this um, session. I give thanks for that, and I, I really appreciate that we have that we have begun a kind of organized way to do this work that must be done and that should have been done a long time ago. So blessings to UTT and the team for making this happen. Now. I'm in a kind of bind, right? Because I have uh, ten minutes, and and um, I'll just say a few things, and I would, I would prefer to just um, identify some points of reference so that researchers and the persons on the on the line here following what we're doing that they could check for themselves, because I have a challenge with the timelines, um, especially where recordings and things are concerned. And so I don't want to, I don't want to speak to anything as though I'm an expert. I speak into everything as a person who was um, in the mix, who was on the road, who's a cultural activist, who is an artist and entertainer, a rap show artist and so on. I speak in from that point of view, 
and the things that I know. And therefore, those of you who follow this with an academic eye, right? Um, do expect me to come down your road. I want to salute Professor Liverpool for his um his opening um illustration. His picture was was beautiful. I have a little challenge with a couple of the timelines. Um, but for me, let me start with saying that when we talk about soca, for me, soca is the soul of Calypso. I have no argument with that. I never went away from that. I never um, find no different way to express that. Um, the soul of Calypso. Now, the soca is also, and I make the distinction here, soca is also soul Calypso. So my mind, in my opinion, there were two different um, approaches to the experience, right? The soul of Calypso and soul Calypso. Now, the point I really want to make to set my foundation is in any music or art form, especially where music is concerned, it's always difficult to identify one person and say, aha, this is the person that make this music. This is the person who create this music. There's always a difficulty with that. I use my lifeline as an example. People come to me and they shake my hand and they give me a loud bong something. They say, yeah, and they introduce me to the, the family. This is the man who invented rap. So, you know, this is brother resistance, he invented rap. So, and I keep having to say, that is not so. With all due respect, before me, there was Lancet Lane, there was Sherry Byron, there were a number of other persons who may not have recorded or who may not have been popular. Before me, there was the Midnight Rubber, there was the Peril Grenade. Before me, there was the Chantwell. I am simply taking the battle and what I have done with my Can life. the camera because and you say it's sleeping on yourself. Yeah, if you saw your sleep. Yeah, what I have done with my life is to, to give my life to carrying this art form of rap so, right? But I'm saying to you that there's no one person, and this is just my opinion, in the creation of an art form, right? So that, so that around the time when Shorty was looking for it, there were other Californians and musicians, and musicians on the line that, and thank Dr. Liverpool for calling with a host of musicians. Sometimes we tend to forget them because we're so in front and waving the people on that stage and we forget the people behind us who drive that music to make us who we are. Um, so there were a number of persons who were looking for it. As a matter of fact, what was trending at the time, I, and that time I would, I would place around the late 60s, just like Dr. Liverpool, around the late 60s, um, what was trending was that um, the persons who were involved in Calypso whether Calypsonian, um, Calypso artist or musician, they were um, desperately trying to find something to engage um, the musical vibration, to put a different kind of energy in what we know as Calypso at the time. Reason being, as it is now, when Carnival done, the media and then there were like two radio stations, two main radio stations, they didn't use the play so at all, so play Calypso maybe on Saturday or Calypso in the evening, like rolling home between four to six and that kind of thing, right? So the soul music, Dr. Liverpool, you're right on point. That time was, you know, that time was, was Arthur Conley and, 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 and Ed Otis Redding and, you know what I mean? He was on the Temptations. We, and we, I was a youth, right? So, so that soul was the thing that was occupying the airspace, the national airspace. And the Calypsonians and musicians felt if you could find some way to infuse some kind of um, soulful type experience in this Calypso music, then maybe we could create um, a hybrid that could make a difference in terms of the music being um, played on the radio stations and so on. To me, that was that was the, the what was trending at the time. So there was no one person at the time. 
follow me, right? So we're talking about a number of persons, um, and some of them, the name I call, some of them, the name Mike and call, right? We just know what we know from the experience that came out in the music, and that's what we have to go with, right? But the point I'm making is that in the, in the same way, for instance, in the steel band movement, we're trying to find who is the man who invented pan. You can't find a man who invented pan, because when he was punging that metal, he had a partner there with him smoking a cigarette or something else. He had a partner with him cussing and arguing. He had a partner with him nicking dice. And, and, and so there was a, it's a community kind of vibes. Same with Shorty. Right? That there were people around. Now, before I move any further, I also want to identify um, that in my line of thought that I would never dispute uh, uh, giving any accolades, taking any accolades away from Shorty for the so-called creation of Soka. I would never do that. Because why? Shorty sacrificed his musical career. He sacrificed his musical career to say, this is the music, and I call it Soka. He did that. According to Dr. Liverpool, people were beating him left, right, and center. His, his compadres in the, in the Calypso world, but they, they, but they, beat, they beat Shorty left, right, and center. Calypso lovers, hello, they want to run that. You know that kind of way? Traditionalists, as you can see them, what kind of stupidness you do with the music and, and Shorty stood his ground. Most important, Shorty gave it a label, Shorty identified what he considered the music to be. And again, as I said, I will give you some points of reference. Check the album Soka, S O K A H. And on that album, there's a track called Vibrations Groove. If you check Vibrations Groove, right, he, Shorty, directly explains or rules out in his opinion what he considers at the time to be Soka. Right? And he told you where it starts from. He spoke about the, um, how, the, how, the, how the rhythm is played. He spoke about the congas. He spoke about everything. He spoke about, um, according to the Lever, Professor Liverpool, the lick. Right? When he said, strum it out, Junior. And yeah, Junior was strumming. That lick is a different kind of lick. Like a different, because that lick is like, it's like a drum playing. Strum it out, Junior. You know, um, so he explains every ingredient that he put into what was then Soka S-O-K-H on that album. So right for reference, um, we should just go and check that particular track, Vibrations Groove. Now let me tell you something. Why is Shorty looking for it? Um, King Wellington was looking for it. King Wellington had an album called um, something about Russo Funk. I don't know if that's the name of the album, but he called the music Russo Funk, because he was out there in America telling himself, hey, if I could take this Calypso here and wrestle with some soul here, I could get a breakthrough. So he go, he said, this is Russo Funk. You know, and he did an album. I'm not sure how much play the album get um, in terms of, you know, people knowing that the album was around. But again, researchers could check that and make your notes when you're talking the business. I want to talk about Outside of that now, Shorty and my show was friend. Shorty and my show was friend. He used to exchange lyric. My show might have given Shorty a song. Shorty might have given my show a song. We don't know. Because in them days, they didn't know. We used partners and we hanging out. They were not going to be an acting. He pick up a guitar and we lime in some way. And I think I start a verse. And he show in a two line in the verse. Right? So my show was here in the mix, you know, my show was right here in the mix, you know, but, but, but for me, um, as I always say, Shorty carried with his life and with his sacrifice of his musical career. GB name doesn't call, why GB name doesn't call? GB was his soul man in South, GB was his soul man in the platform show and the thing, and when Shorty doing, um, when Shorty doing his, his song with change the accent of Carnaval. It's GB we get them, them thing about rock the boat, rock the boat, rock your ship, and all them, all them funky, funky um, phrases and so on. GB was inside it, and GB is a composer, 
he was inside there too. He never stepped out and said, well, you know, I was there. But, but that is a reality of the time. People could, could always confirm that. Those who were wrong at the time could confirm that. Researchers, that is more thing for you to check out in terms of when you're doing your work going forward. Right? So I tell you about my show. And my show, Road Now, came and connect with um, what was happening at KH when, when Kerry and them decide, hey, this thing has something in it, you know. I feel this thing could work. And as far as I know, they will change the spelling to SOCA. I could be wrong. So me making no big argument about that. But when I go by Kerry and them in, 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 in CLUTS, KH Studio, right? My show is there recording, right? And they had a talk with my show about, um, let me try the new Soka thing now, boy. And my show agreed. And therefore, he did that album, a fantastic album. The name he loses, you know, don't vex, don't vex with me for that. But we reference that too. Right? He, so he, he did that album, and then my show name started to call with Soka is concerned. For my show, his, his definition was Soul Calypso. Soul Calypso was my show's definition, as, as this, this thing from the soul of Calypso. Right? At that same so now that we reach in KH Studio, right? Understand that once you go there to record, right? Um, Kerry and them used to tell you, um, you only want to try the um, you don't want to try the soccer thing. You ask me what is soccer thing? Is it get a China? And in that space, you know, they would have a man like Pelham Goddard, who named Moscow. Pelham would have been there, right? Um, batting with batting with Adi Koto from, from, from previous, right? And you get a call to do some work as, a, as an individual producer. Right, agree to flow with the new approach to the music, and so he had to call Pelham Goddard name. Now, not again, I'm not disputing origins and things, I just saying that all are wrong in terms of the origins of the thing. These persons were there involved. Edward's name was called, thanks, Professor Liverpool, again. Right, and Ed, Ed as a matter of fact, started um, to promote himself as the king of soca. But who is this king of Soka? Ed's the king of Soka. Who's the king of Soka? I guess all them kind of things might get shorty. I, I, I annoyed, you know, because in the early days, when he wanted, when he really wanted um, these producers, the musical arrangers, band leaders, to try to try something with the music, they were not openly receptive to his approach, right? But that's something that happened. Right, they all came forward and said, yeah, we was in that. We think the should be this happen and it should be that happen. So you get a little annoyed for that, for one reason or the other. But one thing about music, you can't lock it down and say it's yours and nobody can use it. You know what I mean? Because when you come off the scene, the music will come off the scene too. And that doesn't make no sense. Music is for everyone. Music is for everyone to enjoy. Music is for everyone to share. Let me call some names again before um, my 10 minutes done. And I want to talk, I talk about Wellington already. With you so fun. Um, I've heard Rose, Calypso Rose, um, talking loud about how she creates soca. I heard her talking loud. I say, okay, Rose, go there, girl. I like it when Rose talk, Rose will talk with that kind of way that like, here's a research. I write down that and I said, that is gospel. Because it's the same Rose that said she was the first person when they, when they changed the name from Calypso King to Calypso Monarch. Right? It's because she been the crown and the other was the current monarch, but she they gave her the title, which is not a fact. Professor Liverpool could confirm that um, the first National Calypso Monarch title was won by Hollis Liverpool Chalk Gus. Right? But you're looking for an argument that they're saying you could research that if you want. You know that kind of way? So we're looking at some things. Um, but we must call Rose's name because she was big enough to the front, that, that work that Pelham Goddard was doing for Charlie in New York, right? For Charlie in New York, because Charlie was also looking for something that could make a record sell, that a dollar could come in. And that is how on, that on the line now, point. People looking to sell records, people looking to get airplay, people looking to break through in terms of charting the music and so on and so forth. That was happening. Um, I won't touch Shadow because I think Tammy Como did a fantastic job. Um, where Shadow's contribution is concerned, right? A fantastic job. 
and, and that needs further exploration because she didn't only talk about the baseline and 1971 is a good timeline. She didn't only talk about the baseline, but she also talked about the tambourine with him. So the baseline and the tambourine with him, right? right? Because this is drum and bass business, you know, with the percussion, percussion flavor in between and adding that that energy and that that flow, like the ocean for the ship to flow, to, to, to ship to ride. So please explore um, Tamiko's more contribution as well, where Shadow is concerned. I want to swing it now before I close up to what was happening on the on the, the so-called pop side of things. Because the same with the calypso, you know, we're looking for it, right? Um to to to, to break through um and challenge the soul music on the radio. The same way our, our so-called pop artists were looking for it. They wanted a music that could because they're making good music, all them combos. If it were, well, Dr. Leval, you might you might research combos one of these days. So he's a big researcher and, and um Dr. Hartley. Big combos all over the place making nice music, but they can't get the music play because Otis Redding and Carla Thomas and, and go to your hello. You know what I mean? Later I have a whole song on that. I'm saying that they were also looking for it. So and here is where it fuzzy with me and the timelines now. But I want to throw any names. One of them is here to talk today, Robin Imamsha. A critical um, um, music, musical factor in that. Robin Imamsha, um, Nappy, Richard Nappy Mears was looking for it. Um, I heard some recordings that I'm not sure what the time was. I heard some recordings by Wilson Leisure. Wilson Leisure coming out of the cage. And a song called Soka. Show Tempo Caesar coming out of Tobago. I guess he recorded in cage as well. Um, there's one called Disco Soka, I think. Um, there's Kalyan, who made a, a remarkable breakthrough and gets signed on an international label um, with a song, well, with an album. Um, that one or two tracks, I think, went on the, on the charts. But, but an important song on that album was a song called Disco Reggae. Uh, Disco Reggae is really called the Soka. Disco Reggae is really called the Soka. Right? So that album would have got Kalyan a little bit of um, cultural bacchanal because you know, Kalyan was the number one soca band at the time. And they went out there and we're glad they go going out there and with them. And then they come and they sign this, this deal with a big label and we yeah! And with them when they pour the album. And when Kalyan come to play, maybe in Brooklyn and, and Trinidad and they say, what's going on here? Because they come to hear the carnival bacchanal music. And Kalyan come to show off the music that they have that heading for the charts to take me into a different space. That's another story by itself. Right? But just saying, put them in the mix. Put them in the mix and work it up. Carl Beaver Henderson, don't forget to call his name neither. As a youth man, well, Beaver would have be there around him, I'm just somewhere. There's, there's, there's a team, you know, somewhere around them. His partners, they pick one pocket, they pick the next one pocket. You know, but Beaver. Name of Moss Call, right? No, why have difficulties with the timeline? Um, and this is especially for you, Professor. For me, the, the, the full experiment, it's experimental project started in 1973 when Shorty released the album The Love Man. That's for me, in my opinion, The Love Man on that album had a number of tracks where he fused the use of the Dolak and, and whatever it was from the from the Indian music experience with the Calypso on that album. So that album, like you know, the Fed start, Carnival Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the same way. Tuesday, they say we come out to play. Thousands of gay masqueraders, some young and some old. Trinidad that Carnival is a true wonder of the world. I want to sound like I remember it. But on that album, that was a wicked album. That album disappeared. You don't even see it in the store, you don't even see it on the CD, you know. Um, Mr. Antoine, Henry Antoine, is a man, um, as far as I know, that produced or reproduced that album on CD. And therefore, I want to appeal to him to find some way to get that in the marketplace again. So I want to wrap up, you know, because I think I think I cover all the areas I come to cover. Um, artists or musicians, if I ain't calling them, don't vex with me. You know what I mean? Because I ain't talking as a president, too. We're talking as an artist. As a man who was walking the road and the experiences I had 
um, in terms of seeing the music come through. So 73, that album with The Love Man, and then 74, we that get the song where everybody just say, that's the song, which is um, um, Endless Vibration, right? And in that way, it's a change the accent of Carnival. And we can change the accent of Carnival to a groovy, groovy bacchanal. It was a way to find just groove in the music. Where is this groove in the music? And at one time, the soca and, and, and the reggae at the time was flowing in a, like, like in a, in a kind of camaraderie because the groove in the music was there. Um, and, and lyrically, it's very important, I want to make this point. And lyrically, the Calypso artist was beginning to express the commentary style on the groove of the music. So you could have party to explain her. You party to short the eye. You party, you know, when they put out the album with Progress, Progress from other Sam Studios on an album, a Soka album. So as far as we know, that was Soka. When Merchant came, when Super Blue came, as well as Blue Boy, all these things, that was groove. And the music had a nice kind of way that, yeah, we're going with this. Until, of course, they interfere with that, they interrupt it and say, hey, we want music, we want some wild, wild music, you know, we want some jump up, jam, 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 and we're cool with that. And me and me and Bexo, then, eh? I just saying, so kind you know, it's the soul of Calypso. I don't talk before the flag, man, then my time up. Thanks very much for giving me the um, opportunity to express my opinion where the music is concerned. Soka, the soul of Calypso. Calypso mm -hmm. name, Pong to call. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're moving straight into Robin and Martin's um, presentation, so take it away. I, uh, even all, welcome to the panel, all the aye, persons aye, aye. online. Protocols observed. Um, so, Robin, I, I want to start with a memory. The thing about it is sometimes when there's a turning point, we don't always recognize it as a turning point. In fact, like exactly a year ago this week, we didn't realize the whole world was on the cusp of a major turning point in history. Looking back a year later, now we can say, wait a minute, March 2020, everything changed. So, there's a memory from when I was about 13 or 14 years old, Carnival 1977. We were staying in Belmont. My mother used to carry us. We were, we were from Diamond Vale, but every carnival we'd go and stay by some friends in Belmont. Carnival Tuesday morning, bright and early, Juninum Avenue. Edmund Hart Band coming out of Belmont. And me and my brother pelting up the road to see the most popular band in the land. We're not talking about the mass band. We're talking about the Last Supper. <laughs> and right on the corner of Juninum Avenue, turning on to the Savannah, no music playing as yet, but the whole of hearts, everyone, the whole of Belmont coming out of the Savannah. And as last up a park in that corner, they strike up um, with, at the time, it was the most popular song in Trinidad at the end of 1976. <laughs> biggest, biggest song in the country. And it was Paul McCartney and Wings' silly love songs. And people lose their mind. In, in different ways. Well, aside from it's the first time we heard like a full drum kit mic'd up because most bands that did then, they had some speakers where the speakers was for the vocals. Now we hear drum, we hear bass, all kind of thing. And so all the youths, all of us going crazy. Well, that's, that's our music. And uh, as I say, last up was not a band known for playing Calypso. And right around me, I hear adults chupsing and what kind of Yankee music is that in the little carnival and all this kind of thing. But then, Last Supper dropped the bomb because they had a bunch of brass men on the truck. Just for those who are not aware, Last Supper was a combo band. It's a four or five piece band that came out of St. Mary's, Mary's College. It was widely seen, forgive the, um, the terminology, it was widely seen as a, a white boy band. Um, and, but this Carnival Tuesday, they had a bunch of brass men on the truck. And there's a brass part in that city love songs. And when they went into that, the band switched to a Calypso beat and everybody went crazy. And then right after that song, as the band started to turn out to head into the Savannah, the strike up, Shadow Jump, Judges Jump, which was one of the huge songs of 1977, and that totally leveled the place. At the time, I didn't realize it was a turning point, but it has it stood in my memory. But tell me something about that. So I know you all had started with Edmund Hart the year before, because you all were a pop band that had never played Calypso before. In fact, understanding the band, 
you know, there's a big debate about even whether you wanted to play Calypso, but I mm -hmm. believe that man had made your offer in the year before that you all couldn't refuse. Let's tell me a little bit about that. Well, basically, uh, you know, uh, Brother Resistance touched on it, right? There, there was a development around in the 70s, uh, a kind of an awareness of the uh, of, of, of us and, and what is truly Trinidadian, you know? And um, the pop music section, which was, which was basically done by all the bands in Trinidad, not only last of all, most of the bands were, uh, never really played Calypso, right? They played, um, they played uh, pop music basically during the year. They had a big, big clientele, you know, each one, East, West, North, South, all these bands had clientele. So, Last Supper had a, I had a song out on the radio called um, Trinidad Boogie, right? That 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 became number one in Trinidad. It was and it wasn't even considered a, a calypso yet. It was considered a funk song, but it was really a sort of template of what the young people wanted to do. It was basically uh, give me something from my homeland, give me something to wave my hand. So it was telling people that we wanted something. That is ours that we could sing. So, well, resistance is right. The pop people were also looking for things. Now, that song became such a big hit. That is how we got hired by Ed Manard. It it basically, it's a popular band. It's a popular song. Got ahead, right? And that first year we went on to say, we went into um, on the road, right? We were playing what our constituency or whatever you want to call it, or that songs that they like, and. Uh, out of uh, 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 the, the um, silly love song was not only number one in Trinidad, that is our number one in the world at the time, right? Okay, and we had Doctor Doctor Williams uh, had the Beatles with him, uh, you know, pictures of him. So so there was a, a connection going on already. So we had this situation. We played the song, but we put it in calypso, right? And that caused the big phenomenon that was uh, that 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 that. Uh, they cross over link with um with uh with with with, with the pop music and, and calypso. There was no such name yet, soca or anything. It was just a, ch a changeover that was going on. Yeah. You know? Because because the, the thing I wanted to hit on then, even though this was around the time a few years after Shadow, um, mm. shortly that word soca was out there. One thing I just want to put forward is my opinion that term soca never really took hold until the end of the 80s, into the 90s. Correct. It would be around the advent of the, of the Soka Mono competition. It was one comment I remember that Carnival Tuesday that Ooh. continued to ring in my ears many years later. I remember, I think it was an older, an uncle of mine standing right next to me. And when the band was playing, they said, them fellas real good, you know, but they can't play Calypso. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so there was this distinction because they were bands more to the traditional bands like Emmanuel Marston, Ray Sylvester, et cetera, who and, um, came on from that. But then this the new pop band, the Comets, which became Kalyan, um, Last Supper, and others who were to come after. It's like they were pop bands, but, and, but, you know, yeah, but, then, but then fellas can't really play Calypso. They don't have the real thing. Um, and interesting enough, the year before, when you all first came out, was a big change in the music. Because we had um, Shadow had kind of laid the template. Another Calypsonian from Tobago, Lord Nelson, had one of the biggest songs next to, if there was a song that was second to Paul McCartney in 1976, it was a song called Lala mm -hmm. by, yeah, by, 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 Lord, by Lord Nelson. And then that same year, 1977, the road march was Calypso Rose with Arm um, Temple, All, mm -hmm. also from Tobago. Might be a coincidence, might be something worth, worth researching further. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanna fast forward, I know we have limited time a couple of years later, so by, about 1979, I think Last Supper had dissolved. Um, and, but the impact of it was hearing this band out this big piece of somebody wrote because Carnival was totally dominated by steel bands. A lot of the other bands, as they were only using mics for vocals. In fact, you told me, was it that same year that um, Blue Ventures, the other band in um, the other band oh, yeah. in Edmund Hart, was saying, you know, how come you all, why you're putting, why you're using so many mics? Why are you micing up everything? Yeah, it's loud enough already. Is, is that correct? Oh, yes. Well, um, remember, yeah, uh, St. Mary's College is a real, real problem in, in music. Because when I say problem, a good problem, right? Because a lot of the changes in the all music and in the art form and things come from that close proximity to Belmont. And, and, 
a, a, a veterinary scholar's word. So we used to go to Belmont and hear all the latest music and what is happening there, right? And also that miking up of um uh, of equipment, well, we saw it and we, we saw it in it, it, uh, foreign foreign newsreels and think all the bands used to mic up everything. So we did we started using that technique on the on the truck. Well, what that did was basically raise the things that were not normally relevant prevalent to, to, to the audience, which was to hear the drums and the congas, which was the real rhythm of Calypso prominent in everybody. So all those other bands that were just using the vocals and, and the background and the music was more or less at the, as, as, not even contextual, but just in, in the far behind. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. losing the impact on the audience. So that first year when we came out and we sing the little of songs and, stuff like that, and all these are shadow songs, because you're doing a lot of shadow a lot of rules and you're right. It just so happens that the thread through them is, was, was this Tobago connection, right? But it was really a high life Western African type of rhythm that these people were using mm -hmm. that, was, that was really moving people on the road. Anyway, that first year we came and normally the traditional Edmund Hart was always, he always hired um, bands that were real popular because he wanted to bring people into his, into his to play mass in his mass band. Right and 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 the and the tradition was the, the most popular band music band would start first and go into the savannah because his his um his 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 mass camp was right off Juno Nama at the time right the the first band was the most popular band which was Blue Ventures at the time we were newcomer we're going to the savannah and then we would go in the the, the second popular band would be us and we go and after that first year when we went to the stage and we played and stuff like that we won best playing band on the road you know. With playing that shadow song, right? And the next year, well, when we went on this the, the, the uh, band again, right? we were now the first band in line yeah, to go stage. Yes, yes, yes. That yeah, is the exactly what you're talking about, right? right. But the, but the, the other current that was happening at the time, <clears throat> uh, I just want to kind of put this out there, um, mm -hmm. is that even within Calypso, um, there were different streams already happening. Mm -hmm. And once again, the year 1976, I see as a pivotal year. In fact, in fact. Uh, Dr. Liverpool, somebody should, should do a paper just on 1976 alone, that all these things happened between Shorty, Maestro, Shadow, even Eddie Grant was experimenting, things like that. But Maestro had a Calypso that, that year, 1976, one of the big songs. And the Calypso starts off by saying, they're asking every, everywhere, how I come in next year? What kind of Calypso? Is it fast or is it slow? So even within Calypso, there was fast Calypso, there was slow Calypso, there was commentary, there were many different styles, very different styles of, of, of Calypso. So that term soca hadn't kind of come into currency as yet. I just wanted to kind of keep that in mind. And so I know between last supper and then Kalyan, for Kalyan sort of responded in turn with the big PA system, miking up everything, bringing in mixing boards. The game started to change. There was a now a new sonic thing on, um, on the road. But I want to fast forward a couple of years after, by about 1979, Last Supper dissolved. And myself and Carl Beaver Henderson were the only main people behind Last Supper and kind of went in two separate areas. They came with a new band, 1979, called Chandelier. Mm. And according to you, there was a kind of philosophy behind Chandelier. It wasn't just, let's put a band together. But there was a kind of a particular concept you're working on that led to the name, that led to the what we used to call the motto. Every band used to have a motto back then, like a, a catchphrase, many lights, one glow. What was he thinking behind that? And did that Thank have you. anything to do with, with, with soca music? Mm. Well, the basic philosophy of the band was, uh, was uh, if you understand how music was in those days, right? Promoters will hire bands that are very popular to bring people in the world into the threat. So we had to find a way to appeal to the whole of Trinidad and Tobago. And to do that, the first thing we did was to make sure that we chose musicians, not, I hear this, sir, not because of how good they could play, but if this fit a certain demographic and race, right? So that we, you look at Chandler and you'll find that you have an African, an Indian, Chinese, different, right? That was the first thing because we knew from from uh, from from bands before, anybody could play well if you have a good arranger and you have good training and a good practice and like that. So, the marketing strategy was to always get different races in the band to appeal to different uh, parts of the Trinidad. And the other thing was, we were never going 
<clears throat> to Lee Trinidad, every year bands would tend to go to like New York uh, uh, outside of Carnival, right? To Tilden Hall and all these different places, right? To, to, to maintain and to, to keep our money flowing. And the problem with that was the bands would go out to, the, to New York or Canada or whatever, and they would literally play for their uh, plane ticket. In other words, you know, the, 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 the promoter wouldn't pay for their plane tickets. They'd have to play themselves. And, the, and that money they'd make in Tilenol or in Carabano would just pay, pay back for the money that they, um, they, they, uh, <clears throat> they, they traveled with, right? So it was really financially not a good thing to do, right? But it was just a way to keep the bands operating. What we did was make sure that Chandelier, one had a lot of people, a lot of different races, so everybody could identify uh, in, the, uh, in the band. And two, that we would play only in Trinidad and Tobago. So we started to take this band to so deep parts of the country that never, you, you would not believe this, but in 19, in the late 80s, certain parts of Trinidad never saw all these bands that they're hearing about on, on the radio or in, on TV or in the papers. You know, so to go to cast in Chile and Cuba with Chandler was like, was like, um, like, like Michael Jackson coming to Trinidad and Tobago. It was that big, yep. you know? And yes, that, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so to my mind, that, that had a way of kind of spreading the music and, around the world. And that spread the yeah. music and that carried, take it, take it to, take it to the, not the, uh, the, 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 the model was take the music to the people, carnival time comes, the music will come to your, the people will come to your party. You start to create a fan base. We played at every single um, high school graduation in every senior comprehensive all over Trinidad and Tobago. It was a thing which I learned what senior comprehensive they're playing in this week. You know, Coover, Senior Comcho, wherever it was, you know, San Fernando. Yeah so, yeah, so essentially, this was kind of building up a fan base yeah. uh, among younger people. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'll put forward is it seemed that a certain type of calypso, keep sticking with that term for now, a certain type of calypso, maybe more the fast type of calypso that my show was singing about, mm -hmm. is what appealed to the kind of younger people. So I would mm -hmm. say by that time, by the time 1980 rolled around, the template more um, more laid, so more laid by what short um, shadows approach. The whole people, everyone is using the beat and the rhythms of shorty, as Doctor Liverpool said. That kind of um, straight take on that became the beat. Mm. But in terms of the song structure, in terms of the short phrases and this kind of thing, it was more based on what Shadow and My Show were doing. And something I mentioned in the earlier discussion earlier was that even back then, what um, Shadow was doing. Within the Calypso, you played on a lot of Shadow records. Within, within the Calypso. Practically only Shadow. Only, only fraternity. Shadow. You were privy to those arguments with um, Art Dakota saying, I'm not playing that. Always. And, I mean, I, I remember, I remember, what he was doing was not Calypso. Right. Remember that but time I was a young guitarist, right? And we were, we were all uh, um, signed contractual artists to, mm -hmm. to Kate Records. But I played on practically 15 or 18 of these albums with Art Dakota. And it, there was always a battle. Right, because Art Picoto, as, as Dr. Liverpool said, you know, he, he was adamant he's not playing this sort of short voice, long chorus type types of calypso, right? So uh, he would bring in all the guitarists and bassists and drummer error wise, myself, uh, 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 Anders Nunes, or Garrett, to do these, um, the duty sessions, right? And we would, we would be trying to play what the what the crowd was asking for in Art Dakota sessions. And he would stop the session and say, hey, no, right, play what on the court sheet. This is not your session, this is my session. We don't want no soca in here. You know, so these are the things that, that was going on at the time in the studio, you know. Uh, but, but also outside of the studio in the FET. So I think by, I would say by 1980, it was clear Chandelier was the big band in town. Mm -hmm. Talian was sort of like in second place, like a Renegades, um, Desperados, was going on with the music bands. And these were bands led by young people. Everybody was, I don't think there's anybody in any of these bands older than 25, maybe one of the horn players or something like that. But mm -hmm. it was very much a young kind of thing. And into that fray, Carl Beaver Henderson, who a couple of years before had won the road march, became the youngest arranger to win the road march. I think he was 22 years old when he won the road march with Poza Atelshi. 
um, he he started. Like Pooza, um, by the, Pooza, yeah, yeah Pooza, yes, yes. So he he gave it a rival band called Fireflight. So Chandelier had stepped up the game with big song system, lights, fog, and Fireflight stepped into that free. And in fact, when I joined Fireflight in 1981, in fact, this year marks my 40th anniversary in the music industry as a professional industry. September this year will be 40 years since that band start, but I feel an old earlier. Um, um, one of the first questions I was asked at my audition is, can you play Calypso? And I was like, but of course, well, I was the reigning Calypso champion of Fatima College. I had won three, four years on a straight. So they said, right, play a Calypso for me. So I sat up and I put on the Calypso lick, as Shorty was saying, mm -hmm. and they watched me, Viva, the stoops, they shake their head and say, fellas, we have a problem. This man can't play Calypso. So here what I'd been re already recruited this band and told that I couldn't play Calypso. And it was um I was put with um Keith Christmas, he was a trombone player in the he was a trombone Holy player band. in the band. Mm -hmm. For him to show me some things how to play Calypso on the guitar. And then I was given my task. I was told to go and listen to whenever I could just sneak in the way they were playing, go and listen to Charlie's roots. And I said, don't stand in front of the band, go behind the band and stand up right next to Junior Warward and Tony Vozier and just listen to them fellas playing. And then, I'm telling you this for the first time, it's the same, I'm sure, I was told to go and stand up behind Chandelier and stand up by Robin Imamsha's amp because what Beaver told me is you had a very unusual strum as you came out of Parang, you used to play the guitar with your hand mm -hmm. and you had this new kind of lick. So it was a, a I went to Guitar University for about <laughs> six months straight and after that, Trust me, I could play Calypso. Um, but going in, so 1981, Fireflight sort of came out with a bang, million dollar bang, or the million dollar bus, depending on which version of the newspapers you read at the time. <laughs> um, and one of the questions that came out is, can they play Calypso? That was a big, big debate. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there was a probably my editorial in the Sunday Punch at the time, going into Carnival 1982 is, can Fireflight play Calypso? This was going to be the acid test. Um, it turned out eventually uh, we did, um, but I uh, want to touch on, there are a few minutes left, but I want to touch on something that happened right across the 80s inside the Fed. So essentially, the bands in the Feds were playing a certain type of Calypso, um, which is more the stuff done by um, people like Shadow, Explainer, Maestro, Crazy, uh, more up-tempo, shorter phrases, sing-along type things. But a couple of things were happening. One um, is we were playing the music faster. The music started to get faster, and I'll let you explain why, Robin. But also mm -hmm. the singers in the band, starting with Carl Jacobs in Chandelier, started doing something mm -hmm. that laid the template for the modern soca that we call power soca now. I think it's in the few minutes okay, we have good. So, ba so basically, uh, 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 first of all, tempo was a strategy in parties with bands, right? The faster you could get your calypso to play, to play a calypso, right? Is the more you could get your crowd in a frenzy. And once you finish with them, right, they head straight to the bar, right, to refresh themselves. So the other band that is coming on will have no audience to play after to two because the half of the audience, nearly three quarters of the audience, is by the bar seeking refreshments. So that was the strategy for playing calypso fast, right? For bands. The other reason for, and, and the other problem that, that, that we encountered there now was only certain brassmen from the police band can play with that tempo. So we had to fight to get the correct brassmen who, and they were real proficient like Christmas and Fats and all, and Beak and all of these, all of these um, brassmen that were top in the police band, but they could handle the tempo. So that tempo thing was a, a, a strategy to keep people in front of you, right? That, Keeping people in front of you and mashing up your audience was basically guaranteed to get, get you hired to the next fest because the promoters say Channel is a real good band. The other thing, the other, the other, the other problem we had with this tempo was that our amplifiers that were that were that were, mic that were used to amplify the band would run really hot because of the amount of power we were putting into them. So what we had to do was introduce into the band a rhythm break to let the bass part of the, the um, PA cool down the amplifiers. That will take about uh, two minutes and a half maximum. In that time now, we will say, Kali, 
keep your audience going and he will fight, try to fight for it. Put your hand in the air, do back, back, right? And, and he will keep watching the engineer down at the, at the mixing board to get the signal, okay, they could start the next tune, right? And with that, Carly found creative ways of, 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 um, of, of riling the audience, you know, you know, and, and, and that became a thing in itself, you know, put your hand in the air and wave it, put your hand in the air and wave it. And these things were just done to facilitate cooling down the amplifiers that became now a, a part of the soca mystique and genre. People, people thought it was we arranged it like that, but it was not that, you know? And so yeah, that but, is what... Yes, yes, but, uh, thanks. Uh, but two, two things with that. Number one, the bands, I think, start with Chandelier, really introduced this idea of playing continuously, no stopping in between songs. Right. So when it started, one, two, three, four, tempo from the start to finish. So there's no break, no stopping, no looking for music. She does just tempo down the line. Then on top of that, the bands, what they were doing, what used to happen in the tents, um, the traditional kind of calypso tents, where when it's time for the singer to sing, the band would go low, they would drop the volume so the singer could be heard. There was no doing that um, in the fets. It was, the singer now had to was like shout to be heard above the music. And I remember the first time hearing Carl Jacobs, it's the same carnival 1982, doing this kind of shouting style. I remember the singer from Firefly, um, Steve Seeley, after was going up to Carl Jacobs and say, um, well, what is it they doing? It's like, you're kind of roughing up the calypso, like you, you hold it and shaking it by the scuff of the neck. So they introduced a whole new style of singing. But the thing about it is um, the idea, so this was happening in the Feds for about nearly 10 years straight, from about mm -hmm. 1980 to about 1990. The chanting, put your hand in the air, we go mash up the place, every different band had different catchphrases. We never thought to put it on record until Super Blue in, 19, in 1991, when he did get something on wave. The idea of combining what was happening in the Feds, the chanting was happening in the Feds, with soca and with traditional calypso, and that then send the music in a different direction. But um, another area to research, but I will put it forward here in this forum that uh, when talking about power soca, cannot talk power soca without talking Carl Jacobs of Chandelier and Steve Seeley of, of Firefly. And then after that, David Rudder and Tambu. And that is a circle that created this power soaker. One final thing though, if uh, this is just for researchers, if um, you're trying to understand what happened and get a picture of the music, listening to records is not enough. Um, trust me, what you hear in records, from, I could speak for that 1980 to 1990 period is a mere shadow of what was taking place in the Fed. Like if you listen to Charlie's Roots record, as talk and she's comparing to hearing Charlie's roots in a fet at full power. And on top of that, the tempo on records, most records, they played a lot slow on the records. What was happening in the fets was a different, a different ball game. Cool. Thanks a lot. That's, that's it for us. That's us. And thank you so much. That was very interesting. And we will get back to it in the question and answer section. For those of you watching on Facebook, or you too, please keep the questions coming. We will try and pull as many questions from the chat as possible to address here. Next up, we will hear from Mr. Brian Boyce, the International Soca Mona Competition and its impact on the, con the evolution of soca music. So Mr. Boyce, it's over to you. Sorry about that. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I am just going to be sharing with you on some research I would have done a couple of years ago on the Soka Monarch competition and how it has affected Soka as a musical genre. So just for a quick bit of history, uh, the Soka Monarch competition first started in 1993. Um, at the helm of it was William Monroe. And in 1996, they changed the name to the International Soka Monarch, mainly because a lot of artists from 
uh, the region as well as international artists uh, wanted to compete. So I, I know we would have seen a lot of them compete over, over the years. So if we go to the next slide, Uh, you will see a photo of the ad from the very first Soka Monarch competition. Um, I think we basically kept the same ad structure as it relates to carnival events and that kind of thing, for the most part. Um, so next. Right. So my research would have focused on the Soka Monarch competition in Trinidad and Tobago, as I said before, and how it affected the development of Soka as a musical genre. So just to give you some parameters by development, if we go to the next slide, um, we are focusing on the opportunities provided by the international Soka Monarch the platform. And by opportunities in this instance, I'm talking about the economic benefits, the cultural impact and the innovation artists may or may not have displayed on stage and that kind of thing. Uh, for my um, research, I would have engaged people who would have impacted Soka Monarch directly or indirectly. Um, so I would have compiled results from surveys and, and um, questionnaires from journalists, artists, uh, musicians, producers, DJs, judges from the International Soka Monarch, as well as engaged some cross, a cross section of the general public. Um, so next we we'll get into some of the results. So one of the, well, a few of the, a few of the questions I would have um, used, I, I pulled out just to highlight. Um, one of them was, is the International Soka Monarch a viable platform for new artists? So if you look at the slide that's up right now, what I would have done is I would have highlighted the higher percentages so that we could see the pattern that would have um, come out of the results. Um, you would see that most people agree, either agree or strongly agree that the Soka Monarch is actually a viable platform for artists. What is interesting is that producers of Soka music actually for the most part disagree that it is, as well as you see that the DJs are neutral on it. And if we go to the next slide, uh, the question is, will the absence of the international Soka Monarch negatively affect Soka music? Um, Chris, you could go back. Right, will the absence of the international Soka Monarch affect, negatively affect Soka music? Interestingly, um, journalists, producers, and DJs, and at these Soka artists as well, they uh, strongly disagree that Soka Mona being absent from Carnival will affect Soka. And we have the general public who are basically the viewers and the consumers of, of the event and the journalists as, as well, who will basically spread across the board and musicians are neutral as, as well. Um, so that's an interesting, comparison if you look at the two. Uh, next, if we go to the, the heart of the research, which really was how has the International Soka Monarch helped to develop, has, sorry, the International Soka Monarch helped to develop Soka music. Everyone basically said yes, um, it does help to develop um, Soka music, which is interesting because in the slide before, a lot of them are saying that if it is absent from carnival, um, it will not um, negatively affect soca music. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see exactly how it has helped to uh, develop these soca music based on people's responses. Um, so we looked at exposure, innovation, cultural impact, platform. And um, the next one there in the corner, which is other, right? So for the most part, um, if you look at the results, most people think that uh, the International Soka Monarch helps to develop Soka by providing a platform for the artists. Um, some of them may be new artists who may not uh, have a following as yet. So by entering the Soka Monarch, you would see that they are able to gain such um, and as well as exposure as well, um, which would help them in the end to uh, 
get more gigs and that kind of stuff after carnival if we're looking at the carnivals that go up the islands as well as diaspora carnivals that happen as well. Um, some of the other reasons um, people listed as how the international soca monarch helped to develop soca music, if we go to the next slide, um, are Uh, someone said competition among artists means that everyone will work harder to produce better music. Um, the next one says that the competition serves as an incentive and when bigger stars participated in the International Soka Monarch, it was a stage to aspire to perform on. So basically, again, we're talking um, the fact that Soka Monarch uh, pushes artists to uh, to be on that stage, to want to be on that stage, et cetera. Um, someone else says that many young artists have matured into better ones from being on the, the Soka Monarch stage. It's a sort of baptism by fire, if you will. Um, someone else says it's also used as a, scrum, a scouting ground, sorry, for offering contracts and performance opportunities and that kind of thing, as I said before, um, because it's an international stage and they, we have a lot of viewers, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the world as well. Um, it also helps how artists develop and international soccer monarch is important to carnival and moving world music forward. Uh, someone else also said that it provides a regional stage to promote and expose the art form outside of diaspora carnival. So as I said before, um, Trinidad and Tobago, as we like to call it, is the mecca of carnival. So everyone kind of looks to us as to what will happen for the rest of the year. So if you, if you are, uh, if you quote unquote bus in, in Trinidad, um, you supposedly have a great year in soca music. So basically in conclusion, um, from my research, I would have determined that the platform that the international soca music provides as well as the exposure is able to give the artists is very important to a lot of them. For some examples, we have people like Bungie Garland and Faye and Lions even uh, the most recent winner, college boy, Jesse, in a recent interview, he said one of the main reasons he went into the competition really was to expand his audience and that kind of thing. So again, it really relates back into the research that I would have done. So thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion. And back to you, Dr. Francis. Thank you, um, Mr. Boyce. Good seeing you after, after so many years out of class. Um, and that's an interesting conversation we will pick up again in the question and answer, looking especially at the role of competition in the development of an art form. And our last panelist that we will be moving into, and then we will open up for question and answer. So please keep your questions coming in the comments and we will address as many of them as we possibly can. Um, our last presentation is from Mr. Jeffrey Anderson Bolden, who will be sharing with us the Bayesian Invasion and its impact on the evolution and popularization of soca music throughout the diaspora. So take it away, um, Mr. Bolin. And I do believe this is a recorded um, presentation. So take it away. So just as they are queuing up the video, just to remind all our viewers on Facebook and WhatsApp, um, sorry, on YouTube, wherever you are, keep the questions coming and we will address them after this presentation. I think it's a lovely panel so far, so I, I'm pretty sure we have some firecracker questions coming up. I thank you all for your expressions of care at this time of the recent transitioning of now two family members 
in Trinidad, my uncle's daughter and my brother. It, indeed, it is indeed an honor to be a part of this distinguished panel, which comprises my teachers, without whom I may never have made it to this panel in the first place. I refer to Professor Liverpool, Assistant Professor Hartley, and our host, Assistant Professor Francis. Included in the mix is also Mr. Masimba, along with class colleague Robin and Mamsha. I thank you all for shared knowledge and with humility. I'm forever receptive to learn much, much more from you. Now, my statement for consideration bears the title The Bayesian Invasion and its impact on the evolution and popularization of the soap music throughout the next one. Please note that this is a work in progress. <laughs> that word invasion, or unless it is to be understood to carry an on the tone of bacchanal or leg, will be replaced with a, with a more suitable, with a more suitable impact. So we can speak of the Bayesian impact instead of the Bayesian invasion, which in the musings of George Jones, who was the, who was, who was the former drummer of the Bayesian music band Square One, and I quote, Bayesian scenes hostile in like unauthorized access, unquote. This impact was of such that it brought empowerment to and fueled the spirits, especially West African spirits of the peoples of Trinidad and the people and the peoples of this African diaspora. Indeed, the Bajan crop over was a part of the servants at these impacts. There, the culture of this little England was always on stage. These impacts were like two-way streets. The performers that we carried, but brought when they returned to body this. They brought with them museo cultural best practices of what they had experience to show upon the Barbadian skates. The artists brought back to Barbados their earnings. A, a, a lot of, of the money which went into circulation in the island assisted to boost our economy. Such and more would have resulted in values of these impacts. I'm of the view that since soca is dynamic, any other music form which impinges upon it, be it groovy, bashful, even jamo, independent of country or of origin, will always go towards making the soca more popular and ultimately contributing to its evolution. The Asian musical diaspora impact not soca nature happened as early as in the 1960s with the very men of Barbados. In relatively recent times, it however occurred in at least four musicological performances, performance ways, upcoming fifth wave entailing primarily bashful soca on full virtual platforms. Now, the first recent wave was in the early 1980s. Out of the Barbadian Blue Wave studios of Eddie Grant and Dawn, the driving base, there was Dawn Mr. Hardy, 1979, Jack, 1982. Whilst the mighty Boots, Gabby's Boots remain banned from the airways of Barbados, it was known to have played 40, 40 consecutive times at one fetch in Trinidad. Indeed, it was said to be Trinidad's Christmas Road March of 1984. Gabby's books, in fact, 
was not only made upon Trinidad. He traveled and performed in St. Vincent, where the perceptions and disciples, as well as John. He entertained in Grenada, Martinique, Jamaica, and the Cayman Islands. In 1980, the mighty Gabby called for the rescue of Barbadian art and artists. He wanted this country understood that if it continued to stifle the movement and development of Caribbean art and artists, that such could have led to non-Caribbean cultural penetration. The money earned from his performances in Trinidad, Gabby facilitated the restoration of this school. For his effort, this Trinidadian school furnished him with an award. Kitchen was known to be one of, of Gabby's mentors. Blackstein shares works with Gabby on two albums, which were produced by Eddie Pratt. According to Gabby's former manager, the late Sildan, the best of Gabby comes out in the presence of Sparrow and Penguin. The mighty Sparrow performed with mighty Gabby for over 30 years. In Barbados, Dr. Slinger Francisco performed at the pilgrim tent of Dr. Anthony Gard, Sparrow, and Gabby. Going forward, 1988. Um, I think we're having some technical difficulty. Um, it was just getting interesting too. Um, what I think um, as we are working through that, one question that has come up so far, and um, if I can get the panel to answer that, and hopefully we can work through this glitch. And so while we're waiting, um, pose to um, the panel, and I think this is posed to our producers, they can they lead off the charge answering this question. Um, is there a difference between fast Calypso and Soka? So while we're waiting for um, Mr. Anderson's presentation, for the glitch to be worked out. Let's go to um, answer this question, raising yeah, it so, to the panel. Yes, yeah, so I, I, yeah, and Soka. Yeah, so I can't remember exactly how it was phrased in the chat, but this is what someone was asking as we were talking about what was happening in the FETs. And I would argue to a large extent, no, um, in that, um, but this is what was being played in the FETs, fast Calypso, Calypso that had now maybe evolved more into um, shorter phrases, party kind of thing. And I would say much of what we call Soka now is in my opinion, just the kind of fast love way type of Calypso that was always there. Um, um, when it, if you think back to Mighty Sparrow, Miss Mary, that was 1974, call and response to see Miss Mary, one ball, big and hairy, one ball. All of uh, all that was just like fast, fast Calypso, but I'm pretty sure it would be classed as Soka now. But um, I know not everyone sort of agrees with that, that distinction, but it just seems that now the idea of fast Calypso has gone by the wayside and we have like a younger generation that thinks that um, Calypso is something slow and Soka is something fast. Uh, excuse me for once. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Excuse me. So um, Robin, would you like to chime in on that? Same question. I think, um, I think Martin, Martin um, uh, 
covered it. But you see, these that type of question will come from younger people, right? Because that problem that you're having with the distinction between Calypso and Soka, right, was was um, well, uh, the people young young people considered Calypso to be kind of a slow social commentary type of thing, right? And that uh, and, and Soka was a fast thing, right? But Calypso and and I, I will I, I will, I'm going to make the statement here. Calypso and Soka is the same thing. It is no different. You know, it is just the application of the times. You know, this is basically how we how we distinguish it in um in, in, in the bands and, and how we, we, we get people to dance it. Because we will what we what we what we knew at the time there were certain calypsos that lend itself more to a faster tempo than others at the time. When we started in the last supper, we will choose a lot of the shadow stuff. Because Shadow's the way he structured his music, right, was easier to, to speed up and, and, and intensify because there's a lot of room and space in it, as as opposed to like, um, like a, let's take a typical uh, 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 Kitchener character. Everybody want to know Jericho. Jericho by Kitchener was definitely not a, a song we could use in our party. It is just too much lyrics. You know, I'm the the Jericho, all the time you call and response and everything. That everybody be there with that. We could not use that. We needed that. We needed um, you know, jumping like your feet or just man. <clears throat> I come out, you see, slower the lyric line, right? The faster we could speed it up and get the people to go. So there is no difference between fast calypso and soca. It's just, it's the same. It's just, the structure of the city calypso, how we, how we used to use it. Now, that's basically, I, 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 I give a, a technical thing there, but according to Martin, there's no difference. There's no difference. Okay, and um, for the rest of the panel, anyone wants to comment? I'm um, looking at my Calypsonians, if you want to comment. Resistance. Mm. I, 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 I would I would love to hear Dr. Liverpool's take on it. I would I would too. I'm I'm trying to prompt it in as polite a way as possible. I would love to hear um Dr. Liverpool's take and I would love to hear Spicy's take and Brother Resistance if he wants to chime in as well. Um well well let me let me say that we have always we have always had fast calypsos. We have always had slow calypsos. We have always had fast calypso in, in terms of the road march, etc., for years. So the, the fast calypso have always been there, especially for entertainment. So the big difference between the fast calypso and the soca, that's why I, I, I tried to tell people when the soca came in, it was a rhythm pattern. It's a rhythm pattern that made the difference. For example, after the dum dum rest, dum dum rest, they bought the, a French style with a bass, they bought, they bought a, a all different kind of bass patterns, a Spanish type bass, etc., and that's what make the the, the soca. So the soca, as as we said, as was putting this soul, this kind of feeling into the calypso, and as as Rashford used to say, to make it more danceable, to make it more danceable than a feeling. But we have always had fast calypso. Those guys, when those guys in Antigua began to sing, when short short and Solomon began to sing calypso, they were singing very very fast, very very fast. And when those guys in the Burden Island began to sing those, those kind of songs, um, very, very fast, they were singing it very fast. So at your past, kind of song, when, this, when people talk about the soca, it was a mood, uh, a certain mood they wanted to, to, to create in the kind of song, And that's what they call the soca. And a certain, you might call it a groove, a certain mood on their portray, where they could dance, etc., and, and sway, etc. So the boom, boom. Then they change on boom, 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 boom. And then Kishna brought up, Kishna brought up, what is that? Boom, 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 all different kind of bass patterns. And that's what made that the soca. So the soca actually is a grooving with the bass. The bass is the most important. In fact, as I mentioned, when the soca came in, then we brought the bass lines. 
uh, when he bought musicians in the bass line, Arnold Bass, the first man to play, Arnold Bass, we used to call him Arnold Bass, he's the first man to play soccer with a bass line, you know? Arnold Bass, we call it. Maria by, by, Maria by Sparrow. Maria, darling, I must go. That's the first kid, so I know it's a bass line, a special bass line. And that's where the soccer, be, that's where the bass came in. That's where the soccer came in. Having a, a special bass line, where before we never had that. See? That was a big change. So the difference between a, a fast calypso and the soccer is a groove. Soccer is a groove, and you can always have many fast calypsos. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I think the video is now ready to resume. So we're going to switch back to the video and then we will come back to questions. Um, so take, take it away with the rest of the video. Thank you. I see our chairman there, Madam President. I see our chairman there. Welcome. Yes, 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 Maestro. Um, I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> I, I, I really appreciated that. Um, that musical difference of Soka and Calypso, of Fast Calypso and so forth. Yeah, yeah. This Dr. Slinger Francisco performed at the battleground tent of Dr. Anthony Cart, Sparrow, and Gary Winfolds in 1988. Lost them. Uh, Kayla, I, I feel maybe a better um, solution to this would be that we can send Mr. Bolden's video out to anyone that is interested in, in, in having a look at it. Yeah. That's fine. Um, so I want to jump back into the questions since the video um, has gremlins, let's put it that way. <laughs> and to go back to the idea of, um, we were discussing fast and slow soca, I mean calypso, the difference between fast calypso and soca. And Liverpool was talking about the groove in the music. Um, and want to pick that up. We were we are also, and I don't think anyone mentioned it, but I would like to throw in the mix, especially actually since Robin mentioned um, high life music, and um, Dr. Liverpool mentioned getting music from Nigeria. We were we are also in an era in the seventies and sixties of a heightened Pan Africanist kind of feeling, and I want to talk. I want you all to talk a little bit more about this, um, you brought up a whole lot of it, high life, going to Nigeria, blending rhythms, groove, um, versus whether it's fast or slow is the groove. And that's something that um, Robin mentioned as well. And we have a specific question from um, talking about what does it mean to play Calypso? And I think all these things stem in. So when Martin was talking about um, ask, being asked if he can play Calypso, and we have at the same time this level of experimentation, bringing in these other musical forms, playing with it, the difference between 
soul of Calypso and soul Calypso. There's so much to dissect. And I wondered if we could pick up a little bit more um, on these various issues. So let's um, start with Martin, I'll open up with you and the idea of what do they mean by play Calypso? Well, at, at first I was completely mystified because I'm like, I grew up in Trinidad. Of course I can play Calypso, it's chicken, chicken, something like that. But I, was, I was said, yeah, I could play Calypso. So to be told that I couldn't play Calypso and that wasn't Calypso was a shock to me. And so only after going out and learning from all these people, I realized, A, there wasn't just one Calypso strum or lick, there were many um, variations. And by the way, one of our master's students did an excellent thesis just on the use of guitar in Calypso. Um, and another key figure who, uh, who Keith Christmas put me in touch with was a gentleman by the name of Patches, who was the guitarist with Sparrow's Troubadours. He came in a day and he sat down and he taught me all the different, there were about five, he told me there were five key Calypso strums I had to learn. And the difference from playing with a downstroke and upstroke, literally in a few hours, he kind of opened my, my eyes. But uh, I think also the point of the groove, and to me, this was the thing that was um, thrown at bands like Last Supper and then Chandelier and then Firefly, is there was a certain feel or a certain groove associated with Calypso um, that these pop bands, that these pop bands um, would necessarily given the right feel to it. So, so when, when people said that those fellas can't really play Calypso, I think it was really more of a feel thing, a groove element than um, a, specific, a specific technique kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Let me add to that guitar thing, if you don't mind. When I started in the studio, whatever arranger hired me to play, I would have to play a specific a calypso rhythm that that arranger like, you know, like if I went to work with with um Art Dikoto, right? He would like a specific guitar lick, right? Or if I worked with uh, um uh how do you call him um Ed Watson, he would have a different kind of guitar lick, right? Because each one of these arrangers had a, a specific idea how their guitar strum would be, right? And it was it was it was it was uncanny because. You could actually see, you know, I come from uh, learning to play guitar playing James Brown and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and stacks and mutong type of riffs and things. When I was younger, these were the guitar licks I learned in, right? So using that same technique, right? I'm seeing oh, yeah, using that same technique, right? You I I I created a specific way to incorporate calypso into that type of technique on the downbeat and so forth. But when you started to get into uh, being a session guitarist and you go to play in a, in a studio, you have, to put, you, have, you, have to, you have to go by what the arranger likes, you know? So a lot of albums, like when I worked with, um, with, uh, with, 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 with Dakota, right? He would warn me, he didn't want no kind of funk thing in it. So he, I would play a particular type of guitar a lick for him. You know, and what's on the other hand, and I call it, and, and, and uh, Dr. Liverpool is correct with this. Ed Watson's um, um, dabbling with the Nigerian music, right? Gave him this high life thing. And I, I don't know if you all don't know what high life is. High life is a real West African rhythm, right? It is very much like our soca, like how like how we wanted soca to have the space, right? So I would put this funky guitar like. With, with, with all on hot, 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 all this kind of thing. When I play there, right, right, that is funk, you know, chicken. That you know, that was really and truly, uh, and that was the African or high life, but it was called soca. Now, the, the reason for this thing, where I'm going to ask him, Martin, if he could play that he can't play calypso, it has to do with a certain amount of um. I suppose it's because you're, you're playing in a band and the bands are considered, uh, um, for quote unquote, um, non calypso or as you might mention, a white boy territory, right? So you're all you're only playing funk and pop, and you all know how to play calypso. And I had that same experience in in, in learning to uh, in, in um in Chandelier. I remember, and I'll give you this example. I remember. I, there was a year where I played, I played about 17 albums, you know, all told. 
right? So called on Calypso, right? And I am playing in Chandler in Chinese, Chinese Association. And this guy is standing up in front of me with a dashiki and a fed hat on and telling me, watching me play uh, in, in Chandler, you know? And you're an African uh, looking get up, right? And he keep watching me all the time, you know? So at the end of the, at the, end of the set, I go, I go up to him and I say, I can help you or what? what, what, what um, you're, you're finally watching me all the time. He say, you're, you're, you could, um, it's all good, you know, but no Indian could play soccer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that is a situation that was going on. And, and you just remember something, eh? That year, I must be playing on 17 albums, eh? All told. Only soccer and Calypso. But if you watch him in the look and chandelier, nah, you can't play Calypso. So that is the situation. That is where that, that talk came with, um, with Martin. He could play Calypso. <laughs> that's the next whole thing by itself, you know. But I, that's, that's, that's the answer to that question, right? <laughs> and I just want to piggyback when you talk about high life. Sure. Um, to help people understand as well, high life foments in London with the mix right. meeting of um, Ghanaians and Trinidadians. They were hearing Absolutely. Calypso in yeah. London, and they took it back to Ghana to add to their party music mm -hmm. and they formed High Life. So we're going around and around the world. And I, I think um, to go back to a point that Brother Resistance <coughs> made, that it was a communal effort. Um, and that was one of the things he was stressing and he started to call all the names we have to honor in terms of development of soccer. Um, oh. It's a communal effort. And I, I'm hoping as we are, we have about six minutes left and I want to open it up to the panel for, for you all to give last thoughts, comments, and where we're going from here. I just want to remind everyone that this is the beginning. This is, this is the first step. There's a lot of unpacking left to be done. And this is a brave foray into it. And I do want to bring on um, Dr. Otley a little bit. Um, this was his brainchild and I want him to give him the opportunity to just address us for a short second on where the next steps will be. Where are we going from here? Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Francis. And I want to thank and compliment all of the presenters for their very excellent and interesting presentations. Yes, as Dr. Francis stated, this is the, the first of a series of related events. But the end goal being, and this is with the blessings of the the head of the academy, Professor Liverpool, and also the board of directors, that sometime in the year 2023, and I'm glad that our, the chairman of the board, Mr. M Ember, is, a, is available and with us. So I can, Ember, I know, I know, I know, I don't want to get into the question of whether it's Ember or Ember. The, the, the chairman the of the board. Thing, the French thing. Hello, once you do say Ember, you're good. Uh, <laughs> anything else, but not Ember. Best <laughs> uh, avoid any conflict. That uh, that um, out of the academy, we are we are hoping that um, in twenty twenty three, with the assistance of the presenters and others who may want to contribute, we can produce a document. Uh, whether it's a a, a a a book, a CD, a DVD, whatever, but it, I I think it's our view that Soka and the whole evolution of that, of that musical genre must be documented. And I think it's our responsibility as an academy to take the forefront in doing so. And therefore, this is the first of a series of events that we hope to generate the interest and also the information so that at the end of the day, 2023, we can produce a document, whether we come to a conclusion uh, as to who invented or who created or who were the people involved, that is an issue. We want to put on the table information relating to Soka in Trinidad and Tobago and Soka internationally, and all of the players who participated in creating this musical genre. So we'll keep you posted. And um, you know, and as I said, our, our, our date for publication or release is 2023. Why 2023? Because it signals the 50th anniversary of that terminology coming into the mix. I know there are different um, positions on that, but given the fact that Indrani 
was labeled as the first soca. We are going to use that. It's not to say we are saying from now that Shorty created or invented. That's not our purpose. But we're using that as a as a milepost to signify and 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 to and to demonstrate 50 years of the music. It is time that we document it from a position, an academic position, a research position in Trinidad and Tobago. So all of the presenters, again, and panelists, um, it's your it's up to you if you would like to be to continue to be part of the discussion and part of the production in terms of expanding of your, on your paper, um, making sure it's available to the academy. We will do all the necessary work to put it together as one. And hopefully in 2023, we can produce something for the general public. So thanks again, and uh, I'll get back to you in, in a few minutes. Hey, thank you, Dr. Otley. And as we are wrapping up, we are swiftly running out of time. Thank you to our audience for sticking with us. I think it was a very interesting talk this evening and I want to go around the room and get um, one short statement as we leave about Soka and where we go from here in terms of um, research and academia. So let me start with um, Dr. Liverpool. Yeah, well, I want, to, I want to crash in. I won't talk about Soka, but I want to crash in on the high life because in keeping with what um, but the resistance says, so many persons have contributed. And one of the persons who have contributed to that high life music is Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener's music was sold in, in Ghana. And the man who sold his music was a thief. He was stealing um, Kitchener's music and sending it to Ghana to, to sell. And, it's, and that's where they heard the music. And they changed it and they called it high life music because they, they molded and they blended Calypso music. With the, with the music of Ghana and what about high life music. Many persons don't write that, but that is Kitchener's music. And the, the people in Ghana know about Kitchener more than even they know about even, even Ghana themselves, Kitchener. And secondly, I want to talk to, to um, say something to Martin Raymond in the sense that just as how we have fast music and soul music and different groups, one of the men who made groups in Calypso, and we, I don't know what the, how you call it, you know, why you call it soca, is Postman. I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm, you all know Postman, um, yes, 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 etc. Yes, yes. And many, many persons play the Calypso, Panana, 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 and they play at that old number. But, but, but Postman is bring this song, and only, only Postman I know bring it. So you know, I play, I don't know, he Panana. Ta 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 da, da ta ra ta ta da, ta ra ta ta da, and we call it the postman strum. And many persons today don't play it, but that was a special groove long before the soca that postman brought in the 60s. So different persons have contributed to making the calypso more groovy besides the soca. Thank you, Dr. Abi. Um, spicy. Um, sorry, thank you, Dr. Liverpool. Oh, good. <laughs> Light shining in my eye, I'm getting disoriented. Um, <laughs> humbly apologize. Um, thank you so much. Spicy, do you have any closing comments? So one, one um, I would like to thank you all for having me here today. Um, I look forward to further discussions on the evolution of soca music, in my term, Calypso. <laughs> and let us remember let us remember that soca is a development of calypso all right so soca is calypso and calypso is soca we end in on calypso thank you um brother resistance yes i just want to say thank you for having me here and i i'm certainly i'm looking forward to being part of the um the entire project just to, to, to closing off um, thanks again, Professor Liverpool. And you didn't mention that the most popular song in Ghana for the independence in 1958, it was, was a Kitna song. All right, all right. The most popular song, you know, and Ghanaians identify with Kitna and they identify with Chanda Bego um, based on that, that song that was done for the independence. And that is important for us to note and to know in our cultural history. Um, in closing, I want to say that for me, there are no difference between the fast calypso and the soca. 
But what I have, what I have identified um, from from the success of Arrow with Hot Hot Hot, yeah, is that there's a type of song that we should definitely say is a party song. It's not the structure is a little different from the storyline um, we are accustomed to in the calypso, the three and four verses and that kind of thing. So traditional calypso lovers do vex with the party song. It's a song that is designed especially for we to have a good time. However, they want to say it, and I believe it now, and we love it like that if you love to party. And don't mm. talk like that. The power of the drums, the power of the oral tradition is what driving the entire spectrum of the of the music. That's Thank you. And um, on to Martin and Robin, you'll have one shot final words. Um, I don't want to sing that soca boat, so I'll pass over to <laughs> pass yes, over. Go, 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 go. Yeah, 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 yeah. But for okay, let me. Let me I love that. Uh, uh, Calypso was always a reflection of the times, yeah. right? Soca is just a next iteration of it. You know, we reflect on what we do. So what it, it is always there is no culture without economics. So you have to literally keep the culture alive by being relevant to the times and making money on it, you know, to get it on, on going, right? This whole, we, uh, the whole um, structure of, of, of our music is remember Calypso was first in French, Right, because I was selling and then it's English, because I was selling and then it's trying to get a rhythm, because I soak her and this. So it keeps it keeps evolving. So just remember this. But the, one of these things that um that Dr. Otti just said it is so important. We are so guilty of not archiving and recording and documenting the our our history because Calypso and Soka is the story of us. That is what it is. It reflects in every the whole, the whole um, the whole procedure and arrival. And this is why it is important for this book that is coming up. And I'm glad to be a part of this illustrious panel here for the, for that. You know, thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Um, is I know Brian had to leave. Um, so. I want to thank our panelists. This was a uh, very Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman, President, if I want to say something before you close. I know he likes to say a few words, I'm sure. Pardon? <laughs> no, I think that, I'm, I'm sure, President, if I want to say something before you close. I, I'm begging for him. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you. I, did, I wasn't going to um, the Rocky Soka boat, you know, because. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm so proud that UDT has, as um, Robin said, he said he is um, glad to be on such an illustrious panel. But I mean, we at UDT are glad to have such illustrious people as Robin and Mansha. Who <laughs> can, KH, no, KH, he was one of, he and, um, I didn't hear you guys mention my good friend David Bootman eh? and, and I don't like that. Okay. <laughs> so don't forget David. Also, <laughs> somebody mentioned Patches. Right. I grew up with that fella in San Grande, Glenn mm -hmm. Mendoza. Mm -hmm. He was first called Patch Belly because he had some operation and his belly was all scarred up. <laughs> he was Bobby, that's many years ago and died there. He and Kenneth Toyasu, Chinese. Mm -hmm. But uh, two are the main men in Sparrow's Troubadours. I was so proud every time they had something with Sparrow and so on, I would go on because I grew up with those two fellas in San And um, there was another fella, I think he played with them to um, Stanley. I can't remember Stanley what. They used to call him Lion Balls. Exclusive ex <laughs> <It's the> French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he also ended up touring and going all over the place with. with, with them. Um, so once again, two things I like to say, I'm so proud that you guys are associated with UTT. I mean, these are stalwarts. And I want to, the, the, the sentiment that, that Rudolf this, um, expressed and Robin um, sort of endorsed, 
the whole question of recording our history is very, very important. And an extremely important part of our history, of course, is our cultural history. So thanks for, for this show. I try to attend as many as possible once I'm, I'm around. I'm not away, but not distracted by some other foolishness. I'm so glad. Not that this is foolishness, you know, I mean some other foolishness. I'm so <laughs> glad to have um, been here to listen to all you guys. Thanks again. And we look forward to, to further other um, presentations like this. And of course, as Rudolph said, the, the, the recording of this thing for, for, for posterity and, and for everything else. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim and Imbe. Um, I would like to second your sentiment before we close off to things for the video from our panelist, Jeffrey Anderson Bolden, please email chrison.joseph at utt dot edu dot tt and he will be able to give you a copy of that video so you can watch it in full um we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of what um other other um caribbean countries were doing uh in this exchange as brother resistance reminded us this is a communal um this was a communal activity so that will be, a ne I guess, the next step in one of our future, um, one of our future presentations. And I want to turn it over for the last word for, to Dr. Otley, and he will take us out. Thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday afternoon. I hope this was educational and as edu educational as it was for me. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Otley. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis, for hosting the, today's session and also to all the panelists for your invaluable contributions to this very important discussion. Um, not much to say. I don't want to repeat all that was said, um, but the, the panel, the panelists really introduced some interesting themes that we're going to develop as a paper and share so that we know where the research will go forward from here on in. Um, I, I, I'm very happy again that our, our board of directors, including um, Dr. Um, Dr. Ember and um, Ms. Carolyn Moore are, are, are present so that they can understand what we are trying to do at the academy. And therefore, when we call on them for support, <laughs> financial and otherwise, they, they will gladly <laughs> They will gladly contribute. So the follow-up to this basically is to get um, a document to the panelists and show the areas of the, the continued research. And we have a deadline for the submission of all papers to be the 6th of December, 2021. We've given you enough time to make your, do your research and come to your conclusions. And we are going to use 2022 to edit to further research, to get the licenses or whatever will be necessary so that there'll be little or no hiccups. So when we produce, all of those hurdles will have been cleared. So we have given you some time frame, And um, as I said, keep in mind the 6th of December, 2021 as your deadline for your final submissions. You can also encourage other people who you know may have information to submit and, be, and to participate because as the essence of the today's meeting, and from resistance and from spicy and from professor is that it's a communal event. And therefore we will want to keep the, the document as communal as possible, where we will not leave out anyone's contribution because uh, it's, it's, it was more than just one person from what I've gathered that contributed to this musical genre. So we are hoping to get your feedback, your, your recommendations who we should probably touch base with as a, um, Professor Imbo just mentioned, there are some people we may not know, but he may know, uh, Ms. Moore may know, Rudy Moore may know, there's some other people hiding in the background who may have contributed, and yet Fitzpatrick may know somebody from Chanapuna who may contribute. You know, so we, we need to get the, the pool of information together because when we produce, we will like um, someone to come up and say, well, you know, this is what they did or what did. Although, as much as we, we may do that, there will always be someone who will, who will come and say, hey, I contributed but we would like to lessen that, that number. And therefore, if you know of someone 
who will have contributed to this musical genre, please inform us and we will touch base and, um, and get to them. So finally, um, thanks again for the, the contribution. We would like the board to keep in mind we need your help, your financial support. <laughs> They get this document out. <laughs> so we call it on you all as soon as possible <laughs> with a budget to see how best we can move forward with this project. So have a good day. And once again, thanks for your contributions. Peace. And oh, before we go, don't forget to wish Professor Liverpool a happy birthday. Oh, and yes. We <laughs> left to see many, many more. So thanks a lot. When is your birthday, uh, Maestro? Today, today, today. Yes. Today is your birthday? Yesterday and today. Yesterday and today, he, well, he had two days in one. He born in the hand, he be two. Born between yesterday and today. I'm not just saying happy birthday, not just saying it. One at midnight. You should, should be singing happy birthday for prof. Let's hear your voice. She should be playing happy birthday. She playing happy birthday. She playing happy birthday and the soccer beat. Dance soccer beat, yeah. Maybe spicy. Maybe spicy can lead us to the happy birthday. You know, spicy. Yeah, we need somebody yeah. singing. I'm spicy. I'm spicy. Let's go spicy. I know, up. fine. I'm talking and my teeth looking red, so I'm so sure I could sing. Baba, <laughs> try. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late now for that spicy. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, Professor. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> with all my red teeth and everything, so I'll sing it with the blood on my heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, I'm going to give you and see you, talk to you soon. Okay, bye -bye. good, good. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. God bless you all. Everybody. All right.